I just got back from the latest Disney Pixar movie and I swear I've seen that at least one other time before. Meet the residents of Element City. Air. Bye-bye. Eat this! Why can't it be like the good old days of Disney movies where I could watch something original like Alice in Wonderland and know that what I was getting was something original? Or at least something that hadn't already been made into a movie. Now that I think about it, 12 years before, I'll say it's rude. Disney almost made, <laughs> and 15 years before that, Disney did make, wait, how many different versions of Alice in Wonderland did Walt Disney actually make? And who are all these other Alices? Then you get sued. Off with his head! 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 You... I'm betting it's not news to most people that many of the Disney classics that we've known and loved over the years were based on an already established book or play or thing. I mean, just look at the opening to most of their animated movies during the gold or silver eras. They made it pretty clear that these were modern interpretations of classic fairy tales. The thing is, many of these timeless tales that we now associate with Disney often already had earlier films out there that Walt and his team had used for inspiration. And then they iterated on that with a thick layer of, let's just say, pixie dust. Would I go as far to say that these are examples of Disney ripping off other material and then taking Taking all of the credit? Ooh, yeah, that question gets a little murky. Especially when you consider that sometimes it was the House of Mouse borrowing from themselves. At last, Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland. 1951's Alice in Wonderland is a perfect example of all of this. Adapted from Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass from the mid-1800s, these novels were favorites of a young Walt Disney as he was growing up in rural Missouri. So it made sense that when he founded an animation company with Laughagram Studios in 1921, Alice would be at the top of his list. This led to 1923's Alice's Wonderland, kind of loose retelling of the story that focused less on fantasy and more on slapstick, which was Walt Walt's signature style at the time. And while Laughagram didn't survive, the smashing success of the Alice short, with its innovative technique of blending live action with hand-drawn animation, allowed Walt and Roy Disney to move the business to Los Angeles and open the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio, which three years later would be shortened to just Walt Disney Studio. From this, a miniature Alice franchise was born called the Alice Comedies. It no longer featured Wonderland or any other recognizable element from the Carol books, and instead just had the live-action main characters getting involved in animated situations that were simple and all but guaranteed to get a chuckle out of the audience. So how do you get from... to... What the Alice comedies did do was to provide a major source of income for the new studio that allowed the team to experiment with new characters and techniques. And by 1933, Walt felt like the time was right to tackle another one of his dreams, an animated feature film. And while Alice in Wonderland was the initial favorite, the general consensus at Disney was that Paramount's live action version, which had just been released that same year and hadn't particularly reviewed well, had just left a bad taste in the audience's mouth. And let me tell you, he, he wasn't lying. 1933's version of Alice in Wonderland is pure nightmare fuel. I am gonna show you a few clips here, but uh, but just be ready. Nothing to what I could say if I chose. What you buttons? If you think we're wax works, you ought to pay, you know. It's bigger than a chick. Why, it's it's Humpty Dumpty. Don't stand there staring at me as if I were an egg. Stop, 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 stop. Okay. All right. Need a palate cleanser. I need a palate cleanser right now. <laughs> so rather than risk it, Disney ended up going with another fairy tale whose film adaption had also stuck with him throughout childhood. Oh, slave in the magic mirror. Come from the farther space, through wind and rain and hail 
I summon thee. Let me see your face. How hammy can you get? Uh, do you girls know this character, Disney? Yes, he's our father. The thing is, in 1933, Paramount also had their own version of Snow White. But this one was different than Alice. It was an animated short that was in no way a serious adaptation. So Walt wasn't exactly concerned. Off with her head! Off with their heads! <laughs> But still, Walt wasn't quite ready to give up on Alice in Wonderland. While in production on Snow White, the studio released the Mickey Mouse short Through the Mirror in 1936. Once again, more of a playful tale that incorporated many of the fantastical elements found throughout the Alice stories. Not only did it provide an early opportunity for audiences to start to associate aspects of Wonderland with Disney, but it also allowed the animators to experiment with new techniques that would eventually be utilized in the full feature film. And fortunately for everyone, Everybody, both Through the Mirror and Snow White were huge successes. The studio felt like the time was right, again, to bring their animated version of Alice to the big screen. Film rights to the book and its original illustrations were acquired, the title was registered with the MPAA, and staff were assigned to get to work on storyboards. The thing was, though, when it came time to review the team's story reel the following year, Walt wasn't so thrilled with what he saw. Now up to this point, you could describe the Disney movies and shorts as fully family friendly, but with a slight edge. Bambi, quick, the thicket! Mother! The storyboards that were coming out of this 1939 version of Alice though, they were kind of the other way around. I was telling Jimmy about the Garden of Life flower sequence. You want to run through it? Well, yeah, this is the opening we discussed yesterday. Many of these design choices would eventually be revisited in Disney's 2010 version. The less said about that one, the better. This was not exactly the vibe that Walt was looking for, so he once again shelved the idea. And it's not like there wasn't already enough going on at the studio by this time anyway. Hugely ambitious productions like Fantasia, Pinocchio, and Bambi had not only completely overextended the Walt Disney Studio, but they also ended up being massive money pits which left the company on the verge of bankruptcy. It wasn't until after World War II that things began to stabilize, largely thanks to the US government hiring Disney to produce propaganda shorts. And with that stability in place, Walt felt like the time was right again, again, to get back on the train to Wonderland and finally tackle this white whale. But what was it gonna look like? Would it be animated? Live action? Would it be a musical? These were all questions that the studio began to iterate on and, over the next few years, would start to churn out idea after idea. First it was an animated live action hybrid with techniques that would later be used for Mary Poppins, then it was the literal telling of the life of Lewis Carroll after the release of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in the mid 1800s. It wasn't until a handful of concept drawings from studio artist Mary Blair crossed the desk of Walt that the version of Alice in Wonderland that we know and love today really began to take shape. Mary's vision struck the perfect balance of playfully bold, colorful, and psychedelic that he was looking for. And so using these concepts as inspiration, the entire script was rewritten to focus more on the whimsical side of Wonderland. Just take one look at the many pieces of art that Blair created, and it's immediately apparent just how influential she was to the overall look and feel of the final film. And with that one spark, Walt Disney was finally able to build out his own version of Alice in Wonderland, which eventually would debut in 1951. 
Looking back at it now, the story of Walt Disney's Alice in Wonderland is about inspiration, iteration, and collaboration as much as anything else. Between the starts and stops, the various visions, a world war. Walt had spent over 30 years bringing a novel that had inspired him in his childhood to the big screen. And he did it with the help of various artists around him, both inside and outside of the Walt Disney Company. Which is what makes this last part just so disappointing and so sad. Because you see, at that time, Walt wasn't the only filmmaker that had struggled to bring Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to the big screen. Lou Boonin, a talented stop-motion animator who had been exiled to France during the Red Scare, had his own version that premiered in Europe in 1949. Even though it wasn't traditionally animated, it still caught the eye of Walt Disney, who was still deep into production on his version of Alice. And rather than embrace the competition, Walt went the other direction and went full-scale lawsuit, contending that this other version being allowed to screen in the US would confuse audiences and cause irreparable damage to his own version. The judge did not agree, and eventually threw the case out, but by that time, Boonin's version of Alice in Wonderland had been absolutely buried by Disney, the media, and by theater owners who feared retaliation. Even today, the only publicly available release in the US is a budget VHS from 1990. Thankfully, someone uploaded it to the Internet Archive, so you don't have to borrow your grandparents' VCR in order to see it. The big irony with all of this is that when the Disney version did eventually premiere, it was both a critical and commercial failure. And even though it did eventually achieve cult status when it was shown on TV through the 50s and the 60s, and eventually re-released in theaters in 1974, Walt was never a fan of the finished product, saying it had no heart, was filled with weird characters, and had an appeal to the intellect without anything to appeal to the emotions. It's a curious end to an even curiouser saga that resulted in one of my favorite classic Disney movies. What does that say about me? But if you think that the tale of Walt Disney and Alice in Wonderland is bizarre, you've got to check out my video on Jim Henson and the Little Mermaid. That whole story is like something out of a soap opera with emotional highs and emotional lows and Muppets. Hey